the criteria uh, that seem to uh, uh, describe best uh, the champions of GTCI this year include openness of their economies. Many are small economies who have no choice but being open ones. Uh, education, the quality of education, employability of the skills created uh, are critically important, as well as technological readiness. The ability to uh, take advantage of technological advances is critically uh, important in that context. Technological advances will not affect all sectors or all economies in the same way. What we see today is that a small number of players are taking advantage of these advances much faster than the majority of economic players. And the bottleneck is skills. You know, the higher the prosperity, the more dependent you are upon talent. But we live in turbulent times. And as Peter Drucker, one of the leaders of management thinking, uh, reminded us, the big danger in times of turbulence is not turbulence, it's to act with yesterday's logic. And it's worth keeping that in mind with the rise of populism these days. Now, if you look outside Europe, there are countries which are very forward-looking. Singapore immediately springs in mind with an educational system which for the last 40, 50 years has always looked forward. And it's not the only one. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is another example. And, you know, we could talk about Costa Rica. We could talk about Chile. It, it, on the other hand, if you look at the BRICS, the emerging countries of Brazil and Russia and India and China and South Africa, unfortunately, they've been slipping and they continue to slip, both in terms of their prosperity and in terms of their talent. Although watch out for China, because China is a very forward-looking country. Now, the other question is, what about the developing world with the rise of automation reshoring production back from the developing countries to highly automated factories in the West. What about the developing countries who hoped to be able to ride the wave of low-cost manufacturing? And probably that's going to be less obvious in the future. The positive side for them is that internet telecommunications has been spreading very rapidly across the world. And that opens up new possibilities for the developing world. First of all, we must uh, accept the idea that we are not talking just about automation. We're not just talking about robots in factories doing the, uh, uh, the welding, doing the repetitive and dangerous tasks. Entire professions are being threatened by artificial intelligence. That includes lawyers, accountants, uh, journalists. Uh, it does affect a number of white-collar activities. Two figures are worth keeping in mind as examples in this respect. On one hand, if we look at the students in American high schools today, in 10 years from now, 65% of them will be applying for jobs that don't exist today. Second data, in the same economy, the U.S. economy, 72% of the resumes sent by candidates are never seen by human eyes. Artificial intelligence does the first sorting. Uh, these two examples show how deep are the changes we need to face today. If we add to that, however, that the cost of technology, the cost of robots, the cost of algorithm is diminishing rapidly, it's also good news in terms of reducing inequalities. It allows small and medium-sized firms to get into the market for technology. It also allows emerging countries to shape up new strategies to take advantage of it. Yep. More and more people are working as freelance agents. About 30% of the people in the United States and Europe earn all or part of their income in the gig economy as freelance people. The idea of being a salaried employee is going to be seen in the future as a blip, a 50-year blip in 20th century history. The problem is that, that was the period where the employment regulation in most countries came into place. So if you're a person in the gig economy, a freelance person, you aren't entitled to unemployment benefits in many countries. You don't have social protection. 
you have to finance retraining and take the initiative for retraining yourself. And often you can't even get a mortgage to buy a house. So our labor laws need to be rethought. And a country which is worth looking at is Denmark with its flex security system, which was put in place 20, 30 years ago. It's the country in Europe which is the most flexible in the sense it's the easiest to hire and to fire workers. But they get a lot of social protection when they're unemployed. But with tough conditions, you have to be willing to retrain in a new area of skill, to move to another part of the country, to look at opportunities to set up your own organization or become freelance. Otherwise, that generous support goes back to an absolute minimum. The roots of our educational systems go back 100 years to the early factory age. 20 years of sitting behind a desk, mostly listening to a teacher, and then 40 years of work. It was a very good system for turning out obedient people for factories and clerical jobs. Now we have to reinvent education because people in the future are not going to have one single career for 40 years. They're going to have two, three, four or more different careers. And in that world, the most important thing at an early age is to learn how to learn. What children need is social project skills, which they have to learn in school. And that's a big change in the way in which we go about teaching. And they also need, in their teenage years, as they go to higher educational, good vocational technical skills. It's not either people skills or vocational skills. It's the combination of both which is most important. Now, all of this is a tremendous challenge to our educational systems because the people who resist change perhaps the most are our teachers. The head of digitalization in Denmark told us that after 15 years of technology taking the front seat, technology now is going to take the back seat because the biggest challenge is this challenge of deep, deep educational reform. We also see that the quality of the local ecosystem matters. Clearly, those cities which benefit from the presence of large multinational players, let's say large companies, uh, those who benefit from the existence of uh, well-recognized universities, uh, also have an advantage and do well on the front of, of talent. So clearly, the presence of large companies such as Apple in Dublin, Philips in Eindhoven, Google in Zurich, is playing a significant role in attracting and retaining talent in those various cities. Altogether, we also see that exchanges of experiences among cities, uh, exchanges of best practices, is progressively creating a first league of talent competitive cities. We measured this year the talent readiness for technology of the 118 GTCI countries. That is, their educational systems, are they prepared, their employment systems, and a variety of technological competencies. There were nine countries, there are nine countries, which are ready, well prepared. They include Singapore and Denmark, the UK and Ireland, but also the United Arab Emirates. Now, the characteristic of those nine countries is that there is very close collaboration between government and cities and business and educational system. And that's what we're going to need if we're going to adapt fast. Because the characteristic of Industry 4.0, as it's often called, the fourth industrial revolution in 200 years, is that it is happening at an incredible speed and almost invisibly. 
And without that close collaboration between the stakeholders who govern our societies, unfortunately, some countries aren't going to make it. Cities, in many ways, act as corporations. They are managed in a scalable fashion at a local level in a way that could be very uh, similar to that of private businesses. At the same time, they also act as governments. They levy taxes. They handle public services. So it's this combination of the two that makes it particularly fascinating to study talent at the level of cities. Mm -hmm.